Welcome everyone to the Minimalist Dev Room for the second time we're organizing this. Um, and you know, so far we've had some great talks. I hope I can live up to that expectation. <coughs> so, uh, Lisp is the second oldest language uh, used in use today. The oldest language is Fortran. <laughs> and I just uh, yesterday, yesterday there was a Fortran to uh, LLVM talk, so that's also still alive. Um, fourth, we also had a talk which is quite old, it's the early 70s, I think. Yeah. Small talk is also quite old, so you know, <laughs> these old languages seem to seem to stick somehow, which is great. Um, so yeah, I've 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 uh, went through many phases in my life. Uh, you know, I've I've started programming in the early 80s and went from you know from Pascal to through C++ to uh, Python, Ruby, whatever, Elixir, Scala, D, and I still like Ruby and I still like D. So, what about Lisp? Um, so the first, one of the things I learned is that you know the top two percent of the programmers in the world they they can program in Lisp. Have you heard about that statistic? So of course, when you want to be a top two percent programmer, what do you have to do? <laughs> you have to learn Lisp, so that was an incentive. Um, and then uh, I ran into a number of projects, including uh, GNU Geeks, which is a package manager written in Lisp. And you know, so slowly I started to. And it's surprisingly easy to learn. You know, you can teach a, a, a youngster Lisp probably in an hour, I think. Yeah, the basics. So that that's that's great. Um, but I also discovered that Lisp is uh, very much. A Ruby or a Ruby is a Lisp, really, you know. And I, I met Mats, who is the creator of Ruby, uh, two years ago, and I asked him, you know, say, well, <clears throat> how come uh, Ruby is so much like Lisp? And he says, yeah, actually, people early, in the early days called it Mark's own Lisp instead of Ruby. Yeah, so there's a lot that's shared, and um, so also Lisp is a lot like Python, or Python is a lot like Lisp, um, and you find these things out. But um, there's something else. Lisp is everywhere. And I'm going to talk about that. So Lisp you can find in Emacs. You can find in the education, great programs. Um, AutoCAD in the early days used Lisp. GIMP, Julia. Julia was originally written in Lisp. You know that? So there, Lispers, there. Um, logic programming, Mini Canron. Closure in the last 10 years has, has uh, you know, wedged itself into the business market. Um, GNU Geeks, of course, is very much popularizing Lisp and, uh, and pushing Guile to its limits, and that's the next talk. <laughs> um, then we have GNU Mess, Jan was talking about just now, yeah, there's a lot of Lisp in there. And the Shell, anyone heard of uh, Shell's Lisp? There we go. So, <coughs> in a nutshell, your most programming language, language write writes and then braces and then a, a parameter. In Lisp, you know, the, curly, the braces are just on the outside. That's all you need to know. <laughs> so when people say there's lots of parentheses in Lisp, you know, meh. <laughs> um, and where most, most languages handle scope in, you know, with curly braces in the C, C style syntax. Um, and you, you have uh, imperative assignments, right? And then you do something like uh, uh, concatenation. In Lisp, you write something very similar. It just looks a little bit different, you know. So you, have the, you start with a with a brace, and then you assign the parameters, right? And then you do something with it. But what you can see is that that is very consistent, you know, because functions are always start at the first position in the brace, so that's how they get evaluated. And then you get a list of parameters. And even for assignment, you know, it's it's really a function, yeah, which has a list. So, and the other thing is that most lists today, they allow you to also use square brackets, right? So as long as they match up, you can, int you can ch exchange them with, uh, with the braces. But interestingly, it introduces scope. And one of the things I, I've, I found out quite late, which is uh, uh, <coughs> embarrassing, is that, uh, and this is really beats other languages, you know, I think to the core, is when you run Lisp in a REPL, yeah, so um, you, can, you can just cut and paste the inside of an expression, right, and, and feed it to the REPL again. Yeah, so if you do debugging, I mean, try that in Python. 
So here's a famous Lisp. Uh, it's uh, it's running in a, in an editor. And here's an example. Yeah. So Emacs is written in Lisp essentially. It has a very small uh, C core that, that runs the Lisp engine, uh, which means that all the configuration is 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 done in Lisp too. Yeah. So once you get used to the Lisp sy syntax, you don't have to relearn anything. What you only need to relearn is how, you know, Emacs has has created its world of uh, of um, of functions or procedures. Um, which you just can call. Yeah, so I wrote a function at some point that I wanted to copy the line above, and I probably did it in the most, mo the most inelegant way. Um, yeah, because I wasn't really into Lisp then. But you can essentially write a function that says, you know, take, take the cursor position, copy the line above, ins inject it back into the, into the text buffer. You can even inject it into a different buffer if you want. And this is what it looks like, you know, and it's, it, starts, it starts to look familiar now. And then when you have written the function, you can bind it to a key, right? And this, in this case, it's control backspace. And I see if it works. Yeah, right? <coughs> so I wrote this language uh, extension myself, you know, it's a really minor one. But I think it, it just shows the power of, of, of using a configuration language, which is also a programming language. So Emacs is for programmers. So that, that that point I really would like to emphasize. You know, I, in fact, I uh, I used VI uh, Vim for almost ten years. I started with Emacs, then in a you know, in a in a in a mind melt, I went to VI, and then ten years later, you know, I, I went back to Emacs. And the and the real the real thing is that you, because this is such a configurable editor, it becomes a great programming platform too. Yeah. So programmers love an editor that you can program. And that's what Emacs is. Racket. So this is another Lisp, which is really making Lisp popular again. And the racket has a sh racket uh, comes with a shell. It's called Rash. Yeah, so <laughs> it's an unfortunate name, but there you go. Um, and I just want to run quickly through it because Racket allows you to mix shell commands with Lisp commands, which becomes very interesting. So you can install Racket. I'll share the slides. Um, and then you can say something like, require some modules, right? And then, hey, that's a, that's a shell command. See that? Cat, etc. hostname. And you can pipe it into a Lisp um, procedure. And that pipes it into another one. So what you can do is say, you know, um, turn some trim a string. Or you can say, um, let's see, here's the mixture again. Define host name is cat, etc. So that you have the embedded shell again, right? And do some function operation on it. <coughs> and then you can just run a pl plain shell uh, script, yeah, where, where the parameter is actually lifted out of the Lisp uh, evaluator. Right? And that's, uh, that's already pretty cool. But you can also do things you, you, know, you, you can't even fathom doing in a shell, like parsing JSON. Parsing JSON. Right, so this is a this is a, an, um, a REST endpoint, which returns a very complicated uh, JSON record, um, and I can actually I can just you know fetch it with uh, within uh, within the shell using a Lisp expression, and you know the the record in the first uh, stage of the record is a hash is a is a dictionary. Don't worry, we try to do What are you trying? <laughs> hey, Alistair. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> All right. Is it not the black, the blue one, the black one? Yeah, try. Ready for liftoff? <laughs> yeah. So you can do something very complicated, and then you, if out of this JSON record, you you get you know this this string. So in a shell script, essentially, you can do complicated things, and you can even do you know you can use SQLite as a backend and. You know, push some state into a SQLite file database. Try and do that in a shell. Another thing is the you know the shell scripting program program, where, and probably most of us get caught at this at some point. You know, the shell when you pass a, uh, a list of uh, words in there, is it a string or is it a, a list? Yeah. So here's an example. Here's the shell script that I use to upload some files to my web server. Sorry, to my uh, mail server. 
Yeah, and you can see that the, um, the file name has spaces in it. Okay? And when I actually run the shell, this script, which simply is shell and then uh, using the expansion string star, of course it breaks because it starts, it thinks these are all different files, right? Anyone bitten by that before? <laughs> yeah, so the, the, rec the rash version is that you um, start the shell and you can, you can parse the command line using current command line arguments and you can see if you use single quotes it actually sees it at worst but if you use double quotes it will see it as a string, as a, sorry, as, a, as a, uh, something with spaces. So to write the full script, you could do something like this, um, where you say, okay, we're going to run a system command. The system star calls the rsync and, and plugs in the fn, which is coming from command line, current command line arguments. So this is a lambda, and you know, in lambda, the, um, the actual parameters to the, to the, to the call are, are listed last, which is kind of counterintuitive for us uh, Ruby programmers. Yeah, so you turn it, if, but Racket comes with a, with an, uh, with a nice facility just where you can say for list, function name, you know, that's a parameter, fetch it from the command line, you know, and then run the command. And this starts to pretty much look like Ruby to me. Yeah, I mean, with a little bit of syntax. And then you run it, it works, right? As it should. Skip this. So here's a more full uh, 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 rash script where I, I just show that you can create a loop. Yeah, so the student file lists an, uh, student names with spaces. Um, and then um, I create a name removing the spaces. And then I copy the file, a text, text, text file to the output file. And then I run set. Hey, and this is again uh, just a, um, a, a shell command essentially. Yeah, and this is also a shell command. So what you see is you can, you, you can mix in a loop, you can mix shell, shell commands again, which have a, you know, the normal shell syntax. So I think Rush, Rush is pretty co cool, and uh, for Guile, uh, we, should, we have Gash, if it could do this type of thing, Jan. Really interesting. So there's more reading here, you can read on Racket. Um, and why is Rash so interesting? You know, because Rash is totally hackable through Lisp. So you learn one syntax and you apply it in different, for different things. Need to get out of the time. So there's some hacking guides here. Uh, and this seems to be misplaced somehow. Oh. What did I do? New Guile. I'm starting with the hacking guys, great. That should be the last one. So, GNU Geeks, uh, you've heard of before if you were in the room, um, is, a, is a package manager. Uh, it's a functional package manager, and it's, it's essentially written in Guile, which is a Lisp, again. Yeah, different. There are many flavors of Lisp, and this is one. It's a scheme. And... You know, when you install something with, uh, with uh, Geeks on the command line, you can do something like Geeks package, install, racket, Emacs racket mode, and then I'm going to put it somewhere. That's what it says, yeah? And then you load the profile, which is the number of environment variables, and then you can run the program, which is in opt racket, bin racket, and it will give you a prompt. <coughs> I should have given a Guile example, but anyway. So, um... Geeks is written in Guile, um, so we need to install that first. And I'm also installing some, some nice packages that go with it. Emacs, Emacs Geyser, Geyser, or Geyser, and paredit. And when you do that, um, you can do something like this. Uh, I haven't prepared this well. There we go. You can you can start the REPL, um, yeah, with with the uh, X, with the meta command X shell and then run Geeks REPL. So Geeks REPL is really uh, just a command line tool. Geeks, and it's dro it drops you straight it, it drops you straight into um, a Lisp REPL.
and it allows you to interact with, uh, with Geeks, yeah? so the Geeks package manager. And here, for example, we say, okay, use these modules, use Geeks, use GNU packages scheme, and then uh, tell me about the racket package. And it gives, you, uh, it gives you information on the racket package, including which file it sits in, GNU packages scheme, and the line number. Yeah, so you get this, this facility where you can actually interact with, with the, the Geeks package manager through Lisp. And you can query data. You can say something like package version racket. Yeah, so let me try that. If I, it's always dangerous to try things on the command line. Ooh. Come on. Come on. Um, what did I say? Racket? Yeah, so here's the package thingy. And then I need to say, for example, package version racket. Version. And returns you the version that's installed. Yeah, so, and there's a, there's a lot more to that. So you can, you know, you can get all the information that's in the package manager. And if I show you what the package manager looks like, uh, that's the wrong one. Jeez, too many things are open now. My poor small brain. <coughs> so if you have, for example, here's the package definition uh, in uh, in Geeks. Yeah, you can say define public, which is the and then the package name, which is called <coughs> Ruby Connection Pool. And this is a Ruby gem. You know, it's a, it's part of it's a Ruby package that comes with Ruby. And it essentially say, you know, this is the name, this is the version, this is where we fetch it from. It comes from uh, uh, through Ruby Gems, right? So it's, it's a Ruby Gems URI, and you can see that the Ruby Gems URI, if you know if we fetch it from Git, it would show the you know a Git URI. So we have a high level abstraction here for Ruby Gems. Um, the SHA value just says this is what the, the, the you know the tarball what the SHA value should be like, you know, so you don't accidentally get another one. And then the build system is the Ruby build system. Then it has a native input, so that's a dependency. It depends on bundler. Um, and then you have the synopsis and the description. So this, this all describes one package in Geeks, which is concise, right? And it's also Lisp again. Yeah, so you, you can understand it now, right? Even if you don't, even if you had this one, you know, this 10 minute introduction on Lisp that I have given. Uh. Anyway, so if you query the, the data that's, uh, that was on the REPL, you can actually get this information that was in the package definition. You can just see it here and do something with it. You can also interact with the daemon. I'm not going to run it now because I don't have that much time. Um, but essentially, you can, uh, you can uh, open a connection with the daemon, which we call S here as a convention or store or geeks daemon. You know? So there's not much of a convention. And then you can... <laughs> Then you get a, we, what we call a package derivation uh, of, of the package that you want to build. In this case, or install, this is Ruby. And, and a derivation is sort of the lowest uh, data representation of, of a package. Yeah, so it includes all the dependencies and everything. And then you simply say something like derivation, f uh, sorry, uh, that's what it returns. Oh, this is how, how you fetch the uh, file name of the derivation. And in this case, we want to build it, so we say, uh, uh, Build derivations, you know, with the with the daemon, and then take the, a list of the derivations. In this case, it's a Ruby derivation, which is which was fetched here. Yeah. So, if I run that, it should it should install uh, Ruby, which is always a bit dangerous. Uh, so let me try and cut and paste that. <coughs> Live dangerously when you give a demo. Yeah, so it returns true, but because the package is already installed. Yeah, but <laughs> so it doesn't reinstall, unfortunately. <coughs> Very convenient for demo. But um, yeah, so but that's it. You know, that, that's all there is to it. How many? Nine. Okay, that's cool. And then we have some a concept called the store monad. 
So when people talk about monads, it's, they usually think about things like Haskell, functional programming languages. You can also do this in Lisp. Five. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, so, and there's specific, specific monadic functions which avoid you to, uh, to reference the, the daemon or the store or the connection every time. So, that, you know, rather than the earlier, uh, here we explicitly had to set bill of derivations S and then something. Yeah, so here we can just say package derivation Ruby and you don't have to relate to the, I mean, the, the monad carries the uh, definition of the store with it, so you don't have to reference to it again. And this, this, this is another way of, you know, simplifying the code because you, otherwise you would have many references to the daemon, you know, and, and that's actually not necessary. So to capture it all, you know, with Geeks, uh, the source code is a documentation, I think. <laughs> um, and we show some high-level functionality for building and, 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 and exploring packages. Um, and the fun thing is you can also use a debugger, so you can actually step to, when you build something, you can step through the code that is the package definition and what it does with it. Um, and it's all in a unified list uh, syntax. So your distro here is a scheme library for hacking, you know, through the Geeks, uh, GNU Geeks APIs. And here's some links which are available. I'm going to skip this one. So... Just like uh, Emacs, Geeks is for programmers. Yeah, so once, once you master Lisp, you can do anything, really. So I'm going to quickly touch on another Lisp, which has uh, become um, uh, very important in the, in the business environment, is Clojure. Um, and it, it's a little bit, I mean, the Lisp people in general, you know, when they frown when you mention Clojure, because it's a little bit different from most Lisps. But uh, I think it's, you know, it is it's not, I can't say it's superficial, but it has very interesting ideas, you know, so it's a, it's a different, conceptually, it's a different uh, beast altogether. But it shares things with the other lists, including the syntax. It, uh, it's, it takes a little bit of uh, some freedom when it comes to uh, saying, okay, you know, uh, rather than writing, uh, where did that go? I think something disappeared. Um, <laughs> Oh, no, that's probably the same. So that's a list, right? But this is a vector, right? And a vector in, in, uh, in the other lists, or at least in scheme, would be, would be written like this. And this is a hash value or a dictionary. And this is what it looks like in, in the other schemes. You know? So there's some, 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 some differences. In, and I think it was, uh, this is meant to, meant to make it nicer for people who are coming from JavaScript, Python, Ruby, and all that. But it's the same thing. In fact, underneath it will, it will return similar values. Um, and then uh, Clojure has uh, you know, a lot of ideas around functional programming, including immutability and, and shared state handling, um, which are all, all important. Um, and it compiles to the JVM, which is an advantage if you like it, and it's a disadvantage if you don't like that. <laughs> and Clojure scripts, which is also Clojure, translates to JavaScript. So you essentially, you have one language that can target either the JVM or JavaScript. And I think uh, in a business environment, that can be pretty attractive. But that's not to say that uh, this is the only way to do things. You know, because there's, a, for example, BWAS scheme is a, is a JavaScript uh, interpreter that runs in the browser. And you, wh when you use that, you can do something very simple like this, you know, which is HTML. And then you script uh, the BWAS scheme JavaScript interpreter, you pull it in. And then you can just write the uh, write scheme again. And I think this is, this is actually a very interesting tool. We scheme is a racket ID that runs in the browser, so that's another uh, browser interpreter. Um, Parent script uh, takes a slightly different approach. It's a JavaScript generator, so it's more like Clojure script. Um, And Spock is the, the chicken scheme uh, to JavaScript generator. So these are all projects that, that, uh, that uh, can do pretty complicated things. And it, it all originates on the fact that writing a, a Lisp interpreter is not that hard. You know, a lot of people even learn that, uh, you know, in school, in university, at least uh, maybe not the last 10 years, but. <laughs> um, who has learned to write a scheme or, you know, a Lisp interpreter in school? See? Yeah, that's a few. So, 
it shows you it's possible, right? I mean, if a anyone wrote written a C++ interpreter here? <laughs> they also exist, you know, but they're, they're very crazy beasts. So Spock uh, can uh, compile to either C or JavaScript, you know, and that's, it's a chicken scheme. And I'm, I'm going to wrap up now because uh, the take-home message, I think, is uh, that Lisp is one or maybe many languages that serve all. I think that's, that's the key thing. And, um, you know, there are many great Lisps. Lisp is easy to learn. Lisp is everywhere. It can be used anywhere. It's for newbies and gurus alike, in my opinion. You know, I, I'm probably still a newbie. Um, but what is really important in this age of uh, millennial angst <laughs> is that uh, you know you don't have to worry about what language you have to learn after this, right? <laughs> it's not, you know, there's so many people that come to me and say, you know, should I learn Rust? Should I learn Python? Should I learn R or whatever? You know, and I'm, I'm just say, well, you know, that's fine. You should all, actually you should learn them all. But once you reach to the stage that you have learned Lisp, you, you probably you know you're over it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any, any questions? <laughs> yeah? I noticed that uh, at the Geeks Red Room, uh, there was a lot of uh, answers, dollar sign number. Does it mean it saves all the answers? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the Gao REPL uh, saves all the answers. That's true. <laughs>